Hello and welcome to Building Better Apps in 2016, Three Perspectives. My name is Jay Hinman, I'm the VP of Marketing at NewMob, and I'm here to both host and participate in what we are billing as a primer in helping app owners and app developers build, test, and optimize. And we have three companies who will be talking today, Aptimize, Aptelligent, and NewMob, and we all have a great deal of expertise and experience to share in these areas. And so we are able to take your questions in the go to webinar questions area it just says questions, you can click on it. If you have anything that you'd like to ask of our presenters, please feel free to type it there. And we will save some time at the end to answer them. Um, please make sure to address whom your question is targeted to so we make sure that the right person is able to answer it. And this webinar is also being recorded and it'll be available to all attendees once it's completed. Let's start out today with a couple of statistics, as webinars often do. 224 million different apps are projected to be downloaded in 2016, yet 70% of them will be launched only one time before being deleted. Ouch. Uh, let's hope that your app is not among them. This session is designed to make sure that you've done all of the upfront planning and management to ensure that your app is set up for success, or if your app needs a bit of a boost in revenues or in retention metrics, and whose doesn't, we've got the right people presenting today to give you some good ideas on how to do so. We believe that app owners in 2016 need a laser focus on user experience and app performance, and of course we aim to give that to you today. So to that end, that end and uh, with that in mind, we'll be hearing from three different companies who help app owners and developers tackle user experience and performance challenges in very complementary ways. First, we will hear from Lisa Jakobowicz, who is Aptimize's VP of Product, and she's going to talk about how do we move faster, the secret to painless releases. Next will be Robert Kwok, the co-founder and CTO of Aptelligent, and he will talk about app performance and customer experience, what you need to be monitoring. And finally, I will close things out with a look at function over fashion, the key to retaining app users. Uh, this should go about 35 minutes in total or so, so let's get into it, shall we? We will start off with Lisa Jakobowicz from Aptimize. Hi guys. Um, yeah, my name is Lisa um, and I am the VP of product at Aptimize. Um, and I am here today to talk to you guys about um, painless releases. Um, so just to um, preface this a little bit, um, since <clears throat> this may see an odd place to, to start in a webinar about proving your app, um, but actually there's plenty of data um, that shows that the frequency of app releases has a very strong correlation with app, app ratings, which is of course very related to the um, performance of your app. Um, so if you look at this chart, this is actually showing um, the number of times an app updates um, compared to the average rating. Um, and you can see this, this quadrant has a lot of apps that um, really release very frequently um, and have high ratings. Um, very few, I think, actually no apps um, that don't re release frequently and have high ratings. Um, and then plenty of apps that um, release infrequently and, and have um, relatively low ratings. Um, and if you think about it, that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, so there's a few reasons why um, release speed really affects kind of the, the performance and ratings of your app. Um, so one is, is relevance. You're competing with lots of other apps on your users' devices um, for their time and attention. Um, and releasing frequently means you always have kind of fresh and relevant content um, to avoid your app getting stale um, and say something better coming along like a competitor's app. Um, it also relates a lot to app performance, um, which you'll hear more about later in the presentation. Um, but in this context, releasing faster um, means that, you know, one, you have methods to correct a bug, if something major comes out, you're more agile and, and can get to it faster. Um, and it also means that those smaller bugs aren't, that you know about but maybe aren't enough to warrant another release aren't kind of piling up, waiting weeks or months to get funneled into your next release. Um, and finally, it can really improve the user experience. Um, so if you're releasing frequently, you're kind of constantly looking at analytics, um, getting user feedback, and have it a way to adjust um, to make sure that, that your overall user experience is improving um, and getting better You know, every week or so that you um, have an app release. The problem, of course, is that most companies do not have agile releases. Um, and a pretty telltale sign um, that you're moving too slowly is that your last, release, um, last mobile release looks something like this. Um, so even this looks incredibly fun. Um, I'd love to go to a champagne party with goggles on. 
um, a party like this that comes out of a stressful week or multiple weeks of late nights, um, go no go decisions and kind of last minute changes definitely doesn't bode well for your app. Um, and even though the mobile industry is changing very quickly, um, this is actually still very much um, happening and, and kind of still a problem. So we um, actually very recently surveyed several hundred mobile apps um, about a number of topics, um, and among them was how fast they release. Um, and here's what they said. So um, as far as the question of how often you release a mobile app, um, actually only one third of these companies released um, as frequently as biweekly. So very few released once a week. Um, the vast majority released either monthly or even every two to four months, um, or not even on a set schedule, just kind of whenever there was a need um, and they felt like it was worth it to, to get a release out. Um, to give these numbers some context, um, you know, these apps are major parts of the company strategy, um, and they're actually, for the vast majority, are managed by a full-time development team that, that's in-house. Um, so very few are kind of um, you know, managed by contractors, part-time developers, or, or even fewer by an external agency. Um, and finally, they're, they're hugely important to the business. Um, so in many cases, a third of the cases, actually more than 50% of the entire company's revenue um, was coming to the app. Um, they're not kind of a side project that, you know, these businesses are spinning up. They're, they're core to the strategy. Um, but the release schedule is, is still fairly infrequent. So kind of going back to, to this chart that I showed in the beginning, um, you know, what is it that these companies are, are doing differently? Um, you know, it's not that with these companies the app is more important to the business. Um, it's not that they have um, an in-house team, but, you know, what is it that Facebook, um, who has kind of the most frequent releases of all of these companies, is actually doing differently? Um, and the secret is basically that the release doesn't feel like a release. Um, it feels like kind of part of the major process, not an event, especially not an event that you would throw a, a major party afterwards. Um, and many of you with web products are, are probably familiar with this, um, where, you know, releases goes out and, and you know, people barely notice um, because it happens so regularly and it's just part of the process. Um, but having that on mobile feels much, much more elusive. Um, and the reason why, um, in large part, is that on mobile, you know, decisions aren't reversible. Um, so as you move down the scale, kind of every transition represents a leap of faith um, because it's hard to go back. So you know um, your beta testers, for example, are, are going to be less tolerant than your internal team. Um, but you also know that once you release that beta build, um, it's out in the wild. Um, and same with, with end users. Um, they're by far the least tolerant people on your app. Um, and we delay in re releasing to them because we know that um, any changes to their experience or anything that they're upset about is going to require another branch, another release, another app or Play Store approval. Um, and so we kind of stress as we move down the scale and try to collect all the feedback we can from each stage, um, even though we know each of these groups is not perfectly representative of the, the next group to come, um, and stress and kind of, you know, hem and haw and have go-no decisions about whether we're really ready to move to the next step. Um, and that makes that process really, really slow. Um, so the secret, in essence, is to avoid having to make these decisions all together um, and to build in flexibility into your process. Um, in essence, is to make sure that it is reversible. So a great way to do this is to use stage rollouts and, and rollbacks. So for example, rather than you know, releasing a new feature to all users all at once, um, which is what would happen through the app or Play Store if you just um, submit a build and turn it on, every user gets it all at once, um, you can actually slowly roll out your feature to more and more users. Um, and if something happens, you know, ratings drop, you find a bug or a UX error, um, you can just roll back. And this also allows you to collect better feedback from that actual segments of user groups um, and just as necessary. So for example, you can roll out to one or two percent of your real users um, and see how they're responding rather than having to infer from your beta users who are probably um, much more engaged in your app and lovers in your app how it's actually going to respond in the wild. Um, and Facebook, to go back to them, does this all the time. Um, so they recently you know, talked about how um, their mobile profile videos, um, which many of you may have seen, um, were being released to a small number of users and the UK and California, um, and once they got that feedback, they were rolling it out to, to more people soon. Um, and more generally, if, if you look at kind of your Facebook app compared to someone else's at any given time, you're likely to see some differences. Um, they're constantly kind of releasing features to small groups of people, testing 
seeing how they're performing, um, and then deciding whether to roll back or roll out further. And architecturally, the way this works is um, everything's actually in the code. Um, so if they were kind of following regular App Store processes, this would just all go on to all users the moment um, it was approved by the App Store. Um, but instead, they're actually con retaining control with these kind of if-else st statements over exactly who they expose these features to. So just beta users, even just internal users, 1% um, of random users, only users in California, um, whatever makes sense for a particular component or feature. Um, and then they're able to easily adjust without having to re-release. Um, and essentially, it's a mobile feature flag, which is something you're probably familiar with and, and use on web, um, but is less common on mobile. Um, the concept is, you know, essentially that you retain control over precisely when and who to release each feature to, um, rather than having the App Store release process control that. Um, and it's decoupling these two things, you know, de decoupling, deploying your app um, from showing your users everything in that code um, that allows releases to be much more fluid and, and stress-free. Um, and not surprisingly, at Optimize, uh, this is one of the major problems that we help our, our customers solve. Um, so this is actually a screenshot of our mobile feature flags product. Um, and the way it works is that for any part of your mobile code, um, you can remotely control um, if any users see it and when and exactly who. Um, so for example, um, if you have something behind a mobile feature flag, um, you can control exactly a certain percentage of users um, that you want to see. You can target specific demographic segments, so for example, a certain language, a certain device type, a certain country. Um, you can specify which versions of your app you want this feature to go out on if you have a build where it's really not ready to turn it on to anyone. Um, and you can specify even just a list of user IDs so you can manage your, your beta groups to this too if you want to upload a list of 500 users and have a feature turn on just to them. Um, and doing this has, you know, quite a few benefits. So you can, you know, fluidly run internal or beta tests um, actually on your production app so you don't need users to download a separate app to serve that content, um, which means they're much more likely to use their app um, and also means you'll get better feedback. Um, and you can do this because everything is, is fully reversible. Um, if something isn't working, um, you just roll it back if necessary. Um, and if it is, you can easily scale it up without having to redeploy. Um, and ultimately, following this process leads to you know, better relevance for your app, better performance, um, better user experience, um, and ultimately what we all care about, um, which is higher ratings. So that's all I have um, today. Happy to, to take questions at the end. Um, and with that, I will turn things over to Rob from Aptelligent to talk more about app performance. All right, let me share my screen. Great. Thanks, Lisa. So my name is Robert Kwok. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Aptelligent, uh, formerly known as Criticism. And today I'll be talking about kind of um, using the data that we've gathered and kind of customer stories and also uh, surveys from users um, and talk a little bit about how app performance um, can affect user engagement and customer experience and applications. So a little background on what we do. Um, basically, our company, Appelligent, um, we help uh, basically monitor the performance of mobile applications and talk about how and analyze how apps' uh, performance can affect business metrics like engagement, retention, and abandonment in applications. Uh, what we do is we provide a lightweight SDK, um, and we help customers like Hilton, Nike, uh, Intuit, uh, analyze the performance of their apps and see how those performance metrics are affecting customer experience in the application. So all of us have used an app and experienced um, some sort of performance issue, right? Either you went to a, an app, try to purchase something, you get an error dialog, uh, maybe you, you search for a flight that you're trying to book and you're just stuck waiting and waiting for a list of results to, to show up. Or worse, you know, the app crashes after you hit a button and you're trying to do something, totally interrupting your flow. And so as a user, um, how do you deal with that problem? So if you just take a look at the App Store, this is where you see users venting about these problems. Uh, this is an actual screenshot uh, from a, a finance app that's in the, uh, the Apple Store, and this is a, a real user review. 
And basically what you can see here is that user, not only did you lose uh, you know, that money from that transaction, but now you have someone publicly complaining about your brand, switching to a competitor, all because they tried to use the app, it crashed a few times, and one of their most useful features stopped working. Right, so these huge these uh, performance issues can make a huge impact to all of our users and cause them to leave the app. So, what do you do? Uh, at Apptelligent, we have something we call the the hierarchy of abandonment. So again, you know, taking a look of your app from your user's perspective, what are the main issues that you need to resolve and make sure you're on top of? Uh, of course, the main thing is really averting failure. Uh, you want to avoid failure in any case because that is what really hurts user attention and causes people to leave your app. You want to make sure that your app doesn't crash, doesn't freeze, and you want to make sure that your features are always working, they're not broken. Um, once you have that resolved, you need to prevent um, users being frustrated with your app. That means users shouldn't be waiting for something to happen. It should be a fun experience to use your app your app shouldn't take a long time to start up. Um, uh, common user flows in your app like login and checkout, they should be snappy and, and fun to use. And then finally, uh, you want to make sure your app doesn't annoy your users. Uh, you don't want to be that app where your user's battery drains to 1% and they find out it's your app that's draining that battery. Or at the end of the month, they get a huge overage bill on their data plan and it's because your app is killing it. That, uh, that their data plan, and they uninstall your app. So I'm going to go through and talk about what are the common metrics that we've seen uh, for each of these sorts of, uh, of user issues and talk about some of the metrics that we find the best customers have in our products. So avoiding failure. Uh, the, the biggest thing you can do there is really fix the crashes that matter. And looking at our data, and you can, you can actually go to data.apptelligent.com and, and see some of these metrics. The best apps that we've seen have a crash rate of less than 0.25%. If there's one thing that you, know, you would take away from this webinar is you need to monitor the crash rate of your application. And because that is a real metric that we found for success, it's highly correlated to how many users you have, it's highly correlated to your reviews in the App Store. And we found that about a quarter of the top 25% of apps have a crash rate of less than 0.25%. So if you want to measure how well your, your app is doing and if you're measuring why you're not getting engagement or adoption in your application, it's probably because your crash rate is, is too high. So how do you get that crash rate down? So there's two tips um, around that. One is um, something that one of our customers, Groupon, does. So basically every single sprint, every two weeks, they take the top ten issues um, uh, in their app and they fix them. So they take all the crashes in their app, they sort those by the number of users affected, and every sprint they fix the top 10. And within a couple months, they were able to get their crash rate down, I think it's less than 0.01%. And uh, correspondingly, they saw their App Store rating, it's now four and a half stars in the App Store. So that was a real success case, and I think that's a great model for you guys to follow as well. The second tip here is, Take a look at the three most important user flows in your application. That could be login, it could be account registration, it could be in-app purchase. And what you want to do is monitor any failures that are happening in that flow. So if a user is trying to log in and they experience a crash, that's something you need to fix right away. And again, similar to the crash rate of the overall application, we recommend looking at the crash rate of each one of these individual user flows as well and make sure that you're getting your crash rate less than 0.25% when a user is trying to log in or check out in your application. So that's how you avoid failure. Let's look at preventing frustration. Um, aside from crash rate, we found that the, most, the second most important metric in your application is really how long it takes for your app to start up. Uh, which makes sense. I mean, if you've ever used an application and it's taken you know, five seconds to load, ten seconds to load, uh, you'll give up and try something else. And we found that this is true when we've interviewed um, uh, customers as well through surveys. We found that over 50% of consumers consider an app load time a major source of frustration. Actually, a quarter of them would stop using an app and leave a brand if their app load was taking too long. And we found that over half of the apps in the App Store and iOS as well as Android 
Uh, doesn't matter uh, across category, doesn't matter where in the location they are. Uh, they actually take more than two seconds to load. So we recommend uh, the best customers we've seen have an app launch time of less than two seconds. And that should be a metric you strive for. Um, but it's not only app load time. You really need to, again, take, it the, take a look at the most important user engagement uh, interactions in your application. It's app load time, it's login, it's registration. And you want to make sure each one of those interactions is taking less than two seconds. You don't want that user waiting for a spinner in your app, just watching it go. You want that user to be interacting with your app. You want them to be engaged. So you want those interactions to take as, as, as uh, less, less time as possible. And finally, um, you should really look at you know, why they take a long time. You should look at um, you know, if you're doing a search in your application. We had a customer where um, they were loading a list of search results, and that was the most important flow in their application. And they found that each time a user was conducting a search, it was taking five seconds. And so users were just giving up. They weren't um, making purchases in the application because they couldn't find what they were looking for in time. You, know, they're, you can imagine a user sitting on a bus uh, commuting to work and trying to make a purchase. If it takes more than five seconds, they'll give up. So what we recommend there is looking at those API calls, and I think Jay will talk a little bit more about this in his, his part of the presentation. Look in, and monitor two metrics. Look at the latency, how long it takes for those requests to complete, how long it takes for while that user is waiting for data to load, and look at the error rate of each call, and make sure that your latency is less than two seconds. You don't want that user waiting again for two seconds for some, something to load. And you want to make sure that it's not, um, it's returning results, it's working properly less, um, more than 99% of the time. And the final tip here is avoiding um, uh, annoyance. You want to make sure that your app isn't uh, taking up battery life, isn't taking up the data, uh, your user's data plan. And there's two metrics here that are critical for your application. You want to track um, how many requests, requests are being sent and also how much data is being sent and received. And this is a metric that you really need to trend over time. Um, you could use Optimize, for example, to start testing this when you uh, release this to customers. But really, when you incorporate a new SDK, when a new operating system comes out, when you release a new version of your app, these are metrics that need to be tracking and monitoring over time. You don't want to make you want to make sure that that new um, ad provider, that new analytics SDK, is not increasing the amount of data that's being sent in your application and causing users to uninstall your application. So just to sum it all up, uh, the metrics here, again, you need to, the, the biggest issue really is avoiding failure. Uh, if there's one metric you track, it's, tra it's tracking the crash rate of your application. And it's important to look at the overall crash rate as well as taking the top three critical user flows in your application and making sure the crash rate of those is less than 0.25% as well. After that, once you've had, uh, once you've made your app stable, it's preventing frustrations, making sure that your users aren't waiting in your application. Uh, the most, the second most critical metric we found is app launch time. Make sure that's less than two seconds. After that, take a look again at those three critical user flows. Make sure those are uh, completing in less than two seconds. Look at the APIs that are causing those to take a long time. Ensure those are fast and not failing. And then make sure that your app is not taking up too much data, it's not killing your, your user's battery life. And finally, it's important to trend those over time. Make sure as you're releasing a new version of your application, uh, if a new OS gets released, make sure those metrics uh, are within the bounds of our top customers. So that's it for me, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Jay, to talk about Numa. Fantastic, thank you very much, Rob. And let me go ahead and set this up here. Okay, so really good information there. And we do have a couple of questions that people have asked, so we'll get to those at the end here. Um, my name is Jay Hinman, I'm Numob's VP of Marketing. I'm gonna be talking about function over fashion, the key to retaining app users. And I'd like to start out with some recognition of what app owners and developers are doing right. And that's the UI UX of the apps that we consume. These days, our apps are loaded with amazing content feeds, images, videos, colors, interactive functionality, and tools like never before. And so it's clear we really have arrived at a point where some of our apps are as rich, if not richer, than our desktop web experiences. 
But this can come at a performance cost, as you know, alluded to in previous presentations. Uh, the average iOS app was 23 megabytes in 2006, and the average in 2016 is now 50 megabytes or larger. I'm sure some people out there probably have them even larger than that. The average app now has 16.4 SDKs baked in, and some apps have 40 or more SDKs baked in, and many very rightly so. I mean, since these SDKs from third parties are part of what makes for a compelling user experience or allows them to monetize or to measure their performance. But what do users actually say about the importance of performance? Um, Apptelligent gave some, very, uh, some really interesting statistics earlier that I think highlight its importance. And here are a few others from a variety of studies from Forrester, Dimensional Research, Keynote, and others. For instance, 48% uh, or roughly half of users say the reasons they've uninstalled an app is due to slow speeds. That's half the users. That's, uh, that's not good. And 79% of users say that they'll only try an app one or two more times if it doesn't work the first time. And 84% of users crucially said that they use the app store ratings to decide which apps it, that they want to download. So obviously those have to be you know, rock solid. And we'll talk some more about that as well. Dimensional research found last year that 61% of app users expect their apps to load within four seconds. And once they're in there, 49% want things to happen within the app, which we call in-app performance response within two seconds or less. So, I mean, since many apps aren't actually meeting these metrics, here's where the frustrated user turns when he or she doesn't get the load times and performance that they're looking for. The App, Star, the app Store review sections. Uh, most apps, as you've probably seen, cluster around five-star reviews, not the one in the picture here. <laughs> For the Five-star reviews from people who love you and one-star reviews from people who don't. And the comments can be really telling, though, and they can really hurt the public perception of your app, like this one that you can see here, in which people are complaining like crazy of slow performance, app crashing, images not loading, and the like. And so if 84% of people are truly using App Store ratings to decide what it is they want to download, these are the comments that you never want to see. Could it be that all this attention to an app's fashion is coming at the expense of an app's function? So let's talk about what we call the third-party call conundrum. What, what do we mean by fashion? Again, it is those third-party calls that are integrated into apps. These are things like feeds from content sources, images, videos, et cetera, analytics tools, third-party SDKs, uh, you know, ad networks, things like that, and much more. And as bad as it, this can be sometimes on networks in places like the United States or the UK, they really slow down performance on the 2G, 3G, and sometimes even the 4G networks in places like China, Indonesia, India, Russia, Brazil, and so on. And you know, we call these the mobile first markets because it's where most people's experience with both telephony and with the internet is through a smartphone. And it's where smartphone usage just happens to be exploding. So we absolutely need these third-party SDKs and these third-party calls, but we need to also effectively manage them as well. And so your app's fashion can't live without them. So how do you balance them with function? The good news is that fashion and function can be balanced. Um, NewMob has a simple two-line SDK ourselves that accelerate everything within your app, and in which it uniquely addresses the mobile mile, which is that last bit of connectivity between the edge of the internet and the user's smartphone, which happens to be where 70 to 90% of all app latency occurs. Not only does it make a big difference in speeding up an app's load times and its in-app performance, we keep hearing from our customers that it actually gives them the confidence to bring in more features, you know, more third-party feeds, more ad network SDKs, video, and things like that, because they know that they're still going to maintain a high level of performance. The secret here is to put the performance of your app back in your hands. That's kind of what we're all about. So you're able to manage where your app accelerates. So for instance, if your biggest performance problems happen to be in China or in Southeast Asia or in Brazil, you can choose to accelerate there and not in the United States or the UK or, or Europe or, or wherever. Uh, and NewMob's software-defined content routing dynamically chooses the optimal and the quickest path for an app's content to travel. So, you know, includes all those third party calls. So, and we have points of presence in 64 cities across six different continents in order to do this. And ultimately, it really helps address some of the most vexing challenges that app owners have. You know, your users stay in apps longer, they conduct more transactions, they leave fewer one star reviews, <laughs> uh, crucially, and they don't delete your app in frustration. So, we say that, yeah, fashion and function can now beautifully coexist. 
This final slide here just illustrates the types of performance gains that are actually seen by Numoc customers on a regional basis. The, the orange bars are milliseconds in transaction time with Numob, and the blue and green are without. And with that, and on behalf of my co-presenters from App, uh, Aptimize and Apptelligent, we thank you for attending today's webinar. And we can turn our attention to your questions now. So let me just look and see what they are here. Uh, one second. All right, so we have two questions. Uh, the first one is from Akhil J and is directed toward Lisa at Aptimize. And it says, are there any restrictions on what kind of new features can be deployed via Aptimize? Sure, yeah, great question. Um, there's actually not. So essentially, whatever is in your code um, can be controlled via a feature flag. So really, anything you can code, you can um, you know, wrap in a feature flag and, and have that turn on at whatever time into whatever users you choose. Great, thank you, Lisa. And so the next question is for Rob at Aptelligent. It says, to Aptelligent, it was from Mauricio Medina. To Aptelligent, how do you position yourself against free products like crash reports and why choose you? What's your competitive differential in this complex market, fighting with free and standard products? Yeah, that's a great question. So we, we um, started off as a crash reporting solution. We quickly realized that a lot of, there's a lot of issues in, in apps that are causing bad experiences that are not just crash, right? So first off, you know, this, the first thing kind of I talked about was, you know, fixing the crash rate of your application. But then it's also looking at where these crashes are occurring and what is the impact to your business, right? So it's looking at those critical user flows and being able to monitor where those crashes are occurring. But what we found is for more of our um, more sophisticated customers, where they're moving towards is monitoring uh, wider performance issues. So being able to detect uh, metrics like app launch time, which I talked about, which is highly correlated with user engagement, and making sure that is, uh, that is quick. And then taking a look at all those critical user flows in your app, like login or registration, making sure those are completing in a reasonable amount of time. We found that while crashes are important, um, there's also just you know the, the business context around where those crashes are occurring, but also more importantly, it's the network calls that your users are making. It's how long it takes for screens to load. It's how long it takes for your app to start up. And so if you're you know thinking about and you're serious about uh, you know generating revenue in your application, you need to move beyond crash and look at how those are affecting your business metrics and overall performance issues. Great, thanks. And it looks like we've got a couple more questions coming in. So thank you, everybody. So from Eric Went, we've got, is it crucial to gain a significant amount of downloads right away after the release? Is there an important time frame to keep in mind when it comes to marketing via social media and other avenues? I'll let I'm uh, assuming that was yeah. for me. <laughs> I think on probably feature flags. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think actually one of the advantages of using feature flags is, is you can um, build some hype for your feature. Um, it's actually hard to do that if you release to the App Store because people kind of slowly download over time and then they're like, oh, hi, this is new, um, versus being able to send out a marketing announcement, even have some kind of early adopters or thought leaders try your feature and, and blog about it. Um, and then when you release it, actually set an announcement and say, you know, hey, it's going to be turned on today um, versus, and at that point, you know most of your users have already downloaded the new version and would see it immediately. And so we found it can actually help building hype and, and um, attention for a new feature to delay the release. Great. And uh, Sesh Venkataraman has a question for Numob. That's me. Is Numob a CDN? No, not technically a CDN, though you can think of us that way as maybe a mobile app focused CDN. So rather than accelerate websites, which CDNs have done a fantastic job of doing dating back to the 1990s and, and to that, you know, also accelerating mobile websites, we focus exclusively on mobile apps through a two line SDK. The CDNs don't have SDKs to integrate. Uh, into into apps, and so uh, while we, we use some of the same kind of behavior or points of presence and our own protocol, we think of ourselves kind of as a very different beast that does a lot of the same things. And, and crucially, we focus on that mobile mile, as as I mentioned earlier, that last mile between the edge of the internet and the user's device, in order to make sure that your app is actually accelerated. And let's see, the last question here we have uh, from our Arjit. Arjit Sarkar, 
how much average and 90 percentile acceleration is actually relevant to our customers if they're primarily in North America or Western Europe? My understanding is the latency or loss, loss issues in last mile are in non-developed countries. That's a great question as well. And that's, that's also for Numop here. Yet what we found is that some of our customers are very happy with their performance in say Western Europe or the United States, but where they're getting killed is in Southeast Asia or Brazil or Russia or or even in parts of the United States. And that's one of the reasons we've engineered NewMob to make it make it so that you can accelerate in whatever countries you like or whatever regions. So you can kind of turn it on and turn it off on a dashboard to say, you know, I'm really concerned about my performance in these countries, therefore I'll accelerate there. So we have some customers that do it worldwide and we have some customers that focus very crucially on just individual countries. Sometimes as small as like, I just only want to accelerate in Vietnam, for instance. So I hope that answers that. And let's see, if any more questions come in? Yes, more. <laughs> uh, somebody asked, is, <laughs> I was on another conference, will there be a replay I can watch? Alton Franco, yes, we are recording this right now and we will post it, I'll post it on the NewMob website and there will be a replay sent out to everybody. Um, and Meyer Rank uh, wrote, what is a trend native hybrid app? I'm not. Sure, so I'll turn that back over to Lisa or Robert. Probably. I think maybe the question is, um, are you seeing a trend in more hybrid applications or native applications? I would think so. Uh, okay, I can, I can talk a little bit about it. Um, so I think when Facebook kind of famously said, um, you know, we're, we're native or hybrid apps are dead, HTML5 is dead, and we're moving to native, um, that actually hasn't quite played out. Uh, we've actually seen a lot of customers, um, particularly in the enterprise, where they're moving back towards hybrid applications, going from native to hybrid. Uh, we've seen them used in a you know, variety of situations where basically maybe you have some functionality that where you're, 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 uh, that's available on the web and you want to create a, a, web, uh, a hybrid app that leverages that. Uh, with companies that have less resources where uh, they don't have mobile development or native mobile development, we've seen them use hybrid uh, pretty successfully. And that's actually an area that we've actually invested in. So if you, if you have a hybrid application, we actually created a, an SDK that's specific to hybrid applications because we've seen uh, a lot more companies actually go start going back to hybrid because um, you can leverage web technologies, it's easier to do with development, and it's also kind of um, easy to get uh, cross support because you're just developing uh, one app and you can uh, leverage it for, for all the data of the native mobile platforms. Fantastic. And thank you, everybody, for all the great questions. Um, final question is, will we share these slides? Yes, the entire webinar is being recorded, so we will, which has all the slides, and that will be available right after we're done here. So thanks again to everybody. We'll try to do this again soon. So please follow each of our companies on Twitter and LinkedIn and subscribe to our blogs to get more tips on building better apps in 2016. And thanks again for attending.